Hello and welcome back to another episode of Gifting Gidoxide. Today we are reviewing APR that adds the empty blob uh, function to object ID. So we are now able to just get a hash of an empty block blob <laughs> without actually hashing it. And I thought this would be a good case for an episode because there's a, you know, it's as easy as it can be. So we can look over kind of the general process of doing this. And uh, it's a very nice PR too, because it's already doing everything as I think it should be. So there's barely anything we can change. Of course, we will do our best to find something to make it a little better. Uh, but first, yeah, let's take a look. This PR has a bunch of questions as well. So first Rust test and there are questions about where to put the test. So should it be inline as unit test or should it be as part of the integration test suite? And it's a bit strange that it wasn't picked up because I think it's picked up just fine. Let's run the tests. Uh, let's run the test for Jake's hash and here they are, it all works. So we can follow the structure of the crate. So it's part of object ID, this new function here, empty tree, it's also const, so we can use it at compile time because it's all statically known here. And this is fully supported as compile time evaluation for these kind of things, at least that's pretty cool. And so we would expect this to be an object ID and then empty something. So if I look at the test hierarchy, we see top level crate, gigs hash object ID, and there's a top level module here, empty, empty tree, empty blob. So this is something I would probably just deduplicate and then I think it's, it's fine. Empty tree, empty blob, let's do that. But it definitely is being executed. The author also added a test that wasn't previously existing for empty tree for good measure. That's nice. So let's see where this is used. Can I find the test just by looking it up? Is it this one? Mm, no, that's in gigs. That's in gigs, the top level crate. Let me just go here. Should also follow the structure and it does. So here's from hex and here we got empty, empty tree, empty hash, we'll run this again. That now looks a bit better. Now for the test itself, does it make sense? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, wonderful. <laughs> it couldn't be better because that's exactly how the hash is created. It's a loose, the loose object format that has the object type here in plain text and then um, the size. And because there is nothing, I think that I don't actually know the format by heart anymore, but there's a null in there. I think that's separating the, the content from the header <coughs> and helps to parse that, well, decimal number that is the size. And there's nothing else I would do here except that this seems to be doing it just fine. We could, of course, break it a little bit and see if that does anything. And it does indeed catch this bug. So the bug in the test in this case. Hash contents, that's new. Let's take a look. Hasher, hash hasher, fine to import it. Usually these, these uh, path, these input path are meant to be nice. So we could write good features hash hasher, but that doesn't actually look or sound that nice. Kind uh, object ID is fine. We are testing here. Kind is also fine. Usually kind alone is a bit short, but since we are, you know, using a type from the crate, we're actually testing. Uh, I think it's fine because we know it must be a hash kind. And 
there would be one more question to ask. Can we make this so that we kind of automatically know that we should add the SHA-256 version when we actually implement it? And uh, yeah, the only way to do this would be to exhaustively match on it. And that, you know, we kind of have to force into this. Otherwise, there's probably not much use. Also, iterating over variants, you know, with it's kind of cumbersome. You have to know the variance. But if we could just get one match in here, we would know that this, know that we have to do it um, to eventually upgrade this once SHA-256 hits. The thing is that in many places, this also is not exhaustive. So I think there is no real, you know, if we do it here, there's a ton of other places where we kind of have to search for the use of SHA-1 uh, in order to kind of, figure out how to make this part of the code uh, SHA-256 compatible. So I think, I really think it's fine, uh, especially since there's no timeline for actual two SHA-256 support. So yeah, but that's my thoughts, uh, just to make that transparent. And overall, I think that's a tiny refactor here. So remove redundancy in function names. And that should be it. Let's push into this. Yeah, get LFS a fan and not a fan at the same time. I think it's it's great, but the way it's implemented is just not not all the way through done the way it has to be to be not in your way. So get oxide use, get LFS for a couple of things. And that bites when working with other PRs. Okay, so that refactor should go through, obviously, but you never know. And once that is done, I will merge. So overall, thanks a lot for this contribution. Everything is great. Have a good day, bye-bye.